A fierce fighter with heart and a powerful mind, Midnight is willing to do anything to defend his family, the women he loves, and his business and property. In this riveting prequel to her urban classic, The Coldest Winter Ever, Sister Soldier reintroduces readers to Ricky Santiago's strong, humble, and dangerously attractive lieutenant. The intricate storytelling in this passionate tale of love, loyalty, strength, and survival will sweep readers from the wealthy North African estate of Midnight's father to the complicated challenges and confrontations of the Brooklyn Projects where Midnight lands with his beautiful mother. This story will move your heart and soul and change your life forever. Greetings. And welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. The legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph. Your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I unpause to then tell the tale of Midnight, a gangster love story penned by the New York Times best-selling author, Sister Soldier. Time to explore some more. Let the reading commence. Chapter 10 You seem so serious. How come? It was a female from around my way breaking my concentration when I paused for five seconds on the block to organize my thoughts. It wasn't just any female. Her name was Heavenly Paradise, a.k.a. Heaven on Earth. She was famous for her light brown eyes and mean <laughs> walk. Boys battled one another for her with their fists and their finances. She always ended up with either the strongest or richest. You could always tell who was getting it by the gold pendant she wore around her neck. They all gave her either their gold nameplate or their pendant to rock. I heard that even when she broke up with them, she never gave it back. Dudes knew they had to pay to play, try to cut their losses, and charge the rest to the game. In the streets, everybody knew she was complex woman these days. He sported her like her p was brand new and kept her real close. She was wearing his pendant, a 14 carat gold dagger. Everybody knew Conflict was Superior's younger brother. Superior was the most infamous hustler in my area by now. Conflict was his blood brother and right hand man. I didn't call this girl over, so I didn't know what she was trying to do by approaching me on the block in front of everybody. I did know that all the males out here sweated her hard, but conflict had her on lock. I didn't sweat her at all. She was somebody else's piece, and I respected that. Besides, I never messed with another man's woman, money, or property. Ever since I won the pull-up contest that Daekwon sponsored on the block, Heavenly Paradise set her eyes on me, and she wasn't used to getting turned down. Now that I'm 14, my voice is deep, accent long gone. I chill every day in the most wanted styles. My kicks are fresh. I keep money in my pocket. I'm closing in on six feet one. My body is cut like what? Girls think I did it for them. I did it for war. Now I can't keep these females off of me. The more I show them nothing, no interest at all, the harder they come for me. Sh** got crazy. What could I tell them seriously? Could I tell them, I was born Muslim and we don't believe in dating or sex before marriage? 
I was not the kind of Muslim they were used to seeing or being or hearing about, like the ones who were born Christian in America who suddenly changed their name to something Islamic sounding and other than playing Islamic dress up, they don't do anything that a Muslim is supposed to do. Or the ones just make believing that they're Muslims who f*** all the women, never marry them, abandon all the babies, and talk a lot of shit that don't add up to nothing. Could I tell them, yeah, you look good to me, which was the truth, but you're a ran through ho and my moms will never accept you, which was the truth also. Nah, I couldn't tell them nothing. So I didn't. I was known for being quiet and serious and silent. I see you always got a book in your pocket. Do you read them or just carry them around? She asked, smiling and very confident in herself. Now she had one hand on her hip, gripping her little waistline, twisting her little body to make sure I could see the curve of her famous ass, which poked out even when she rocked long skirts. The fact of the matter was, if I was back home in my grandfather's African village, at age 14, I could rightfully be planning to marry, own a piece of land, and start a family. To some people, this might sound crazy. I understood it 100%. I could feel the difference in myself from when I was 12 or even 13. At 14, I feel stronger. My observations are sharper. I looked at things a bit differently than I did before. In my body, I felt a force, a yearning, a hunger. In my grandfather's village, they must have understood the human body and mind. They built a village that could stay in step with reality. If at 14, the natural thing was to feel free and become sexual, then at 14, you can marry and start a family and become responsible and respectable. In the USA, the society was way out of pace with the natural development of its young. They made it a shame for youth to feel and be sexual at 14 and looked away while they knew it was happening randomly anyway. Adults acted surprised and disgusted when teens got pregnant. Then they pressed them to kill their seeds. The laws made it premature and illegal for teens to marry or to even get working papers and become responsible and earn. I knew because around my way, a young teenage girl named Raven got pregnant by a mild-mannered cat named Thomas. Her mother dragged her in tears to the abortion clinic. Three days later, Thomas shot and killed his girlfriend's mother for killing his unborn. I considered myself a disciplined cat, but under Plan USA. Even when a youth graduates from high school, his parents is still hollering, Finish your education first! Next, he does four or five years of undergraduate school at some college. Still, the adults are hollering, Secure a good job first, then start a family! No matter how disciplined the youth is, could he really hold off completely? Could he resist his sexual nature until he's 23 years old? Or is it the American way for the young to abort all of the babies they create up until the time they are eligible to marry, have completed their studies, and are qualified to work? Reality says no, so the block was bursting with chaos. Everybody's f***ing everybody. Nobody's married, nobody claims responsibility, nobody's respected. I gotta go, I told Heavenly Paradise and pushed off. I could hear her sucking her teeth at me. Even though I knew she would not give up, I just kept it moving. There was more than enough business for me to handle. Chapter 11 Monday through Thursday, I play basketball at night after my sister and my moms, along with the majority of people in the hood who don't want no problems, were in a deep sleep. 
I like the court better when it's empty. Dribbling the ball always releases my tension. Sinking the ball in the hoop makes me feel good about my possibilities. I dreamed of playing basketball blindfolded, getting so familiar with the dimensions of the court and becoming so aware and comfortable that I could just sense the position of the basket and sink the ball all net. I figured once I could start hitting those three-pointers blindfolded, I could do any f***ing thing. But it was just a dream. I'm too smart to close or cover my eyes while I'm out on the Brooklyn streets, even in the neighborhood playground. After a while, there was an old wino cat who started leaning on the fence watching me play. He used to call me Midnight, since I only played late at night. Every now and then, he'd bring a drinking partner. They'd stand on the side, drink, and talk sh**. It wasn't long before the name Midnight stuck to me. One night out, the court was all dark and foggy. Either somebody had busted a street lamp or it just blew out. Since I could barely see anything, I figured this was my chance to test my senses without having to close my eyes. This was the same night I met a young cat who stepped right out of the darkness and started speaking to me. Peace, God, he hollered out. Right off, I knew he was a five percenter, like Daquan, Superior, Conflict, Heavenly, and a bunch of people living and dying around my way. They believed that the black man is God, so they addressed black boys and men as God, and the black girls and women were called Earth. Some of them claimed to have something to do with Islam, some of them didn't. It didn't matter to me. What they said or call themselves, I kept my eyes on them. It doesn't matter what anyone says, just give them a little bit of time and they'll prove who they are and what they really believe by how they're living day to day. Over time, I learned to deal with them like they was just another group of people who were not all the way true or serious. I didn't lock horns with them, though. I didn't waste my time trying to knock them. I moved around them and kept my own beliefs, pace, and flow. Yeah, you nice with it, he added. You should come play on the team. Now I could see the outline of his body, but not the details of his face. Yet I could tell from his voice that he wasn't from my block. I checked the distance between him and my guns that I had stashed on the side. I told myself I messed up. This guy caught me slipping. If he wanted to do me something, it would be my bad all the way. But it wasn't his angle. I'm Tyreek. And you? He asked. Instinctively, I told him, Midnight. He wanted me to come up to the school and play on his team. I told him I couldn't because I was busy and didn't have time for every day after school practices and a coach running my life. Nah, God, he said. This is not the school team. We just rent their court and sometimes their gym. You know, like intramural. I didn't know what intramural meant, so I just stayed quiet. He explained that this was just the best young ballers in Brooklyn competing against one another in a tournament. He said it didn't matter if I wasn't a quote-unquote schoolboy. He gave me the info on the meeting spot, time, and place, and went on his way. I dribbled the ball while I watched him walk away. My side hustles kept me moving in and out of all types of situations. We ride together, Uma and I still. After I get Uma to a workplace, I am free to handle business, home school work, or whatever is necessary. On early Friday and Saturday mornings, I always head to Chinatown, located in Lower Manhattan, where I have a part-time job in a fish market owned by a Chinaman named Cho. I caught the job one day while shopping for fresh fish for my mother to cook. She didn't care how far I had to go to find fresh food that she would feel good about cooking. She often said that the local markets were selling Brooklyn Black's old, expired, and sometimes even rotten food. While searching for a proper fish market, she taught me how to pull the fish gills back and check for the dark red color to be sure that a fish is fresh. 
a fading pink meant it was not fresh. If the gills were cut out and the fish was cut into pieces or filleted and flaking, it meant it was old fish and the grocer was trying to get over. If the eyeballs of the fish were bloated or expanded in any way or cloudy, this meant the fish was old. Flip it over, my mother would say to me in Arabic. You must check both sides and both fish eyes for freshness. The Chinaman had fish so fresh that some of them were still alive. He stick his hand in a huge tank and yank it out. On the scale, the snapper would still be breathing. When I discovered this particular fish shop, I noticed the Chinaman had a picture on the side wall of himself at the helm of a real pretty red 36-foot Raynell fishing boat out on the deep waters of the ocean. I asked him if the boat was his. He pretended not to hear me or understand. They were good at ignoring. I followed up and asked him if he was hiring. He told me the price of my seafood order, accepted my money, and moved right on to his next customer. I was still interested. I had a thing for boats ever since I was accompanied by my father on a business trip in a badass yacht named Ali Salama, cruising across the Red Sea on the invite of a Saudi Arabian prince. In the Sudan, even traveling up the Nile on the Falouka was an adventure. It was just the feeling and the freedom that moving across the waters created within me. Besides, the Chinaman had a crazy knife collection. I liked the way he wielded them, slicing the fish so precisely and easily. My father taught me that language should never be the thing that separates one group of people from another. It's easy to pick up a language if you just learn how to listen. He also taught me that people will treat you better when you take time to learn their greetings and customs. Soon enough, I picked up a Chinese language book for a few dollars from a used bookstore. Easily, I learned how to introduce myself in Chinese and, of course, the Chinese word for boat, Chuan. I headed back to the fish store the next week, took my time introducing myself in Chinese, and asked if he had work. I did get a smile, but nothing else from the quiet, hard-working Chinaman who seemed to only talk and only understand the language of numbers. I placed my order, paid, and bounced. The following week, I showed up in my flannel work shirt, jeans, and Tims with my fish scaler in my hand. I told him in English that I would work the first day for free. Somehow, he understood that. I caught the job. Every Friday and Saturday, from 7 a.m. till 3 p.m., I worked doing everything. Unloading fish from the truck, dropping the live ones into tanks, placing fresh and frozen fish on ice, or scaling, then chopping off fish heads and splitting fish bellies open and gutting them. Chinatown for me was an amazing place that sometimes reminded me of my capital city of Khartoum back home in the Sudan, where my father had an executive business apartment separate from our state. Chinatown was all about buying and selling any and everything from Chinese herbs to dried out chicken feet and snake tails, snake oil, clothing, jewels, or restaurant equipment. Every inch of space and property was fully used, nothing wasted, including fish eyeballs and fish heads. I observed short and slim Chinamen making a business out of only two feet of space. For ten hours, they would sell whatever they had to offer. A lot of Chinatown was about language and letters and codes. They spoke a different language, used a different system of letters, and sometimes hung up signs and prices that no one else but the Chinese people could read and understand. On the low, they even had separate prices for the Chinese. I watched Cho switch up the numbers when his own kind came around. I wasn't mad at it, though. I thought it was cool, and the same thing any group of people would do for themselves and their people if they had any sense. 
show warmed up to me, I believe, because I always showed up on time, made no excuses, and worked hard at anything he asked me to do. This was how it was supposed to be, I thought to myself. He asked no questions about who gave me permission to work, my age, or schooling. He didn't request working papers or social security numbers or nothing. We just got down to getting what needed to be done, done. It turned out that he knew a lot more English than he originally let on. He paid me in cash at the end of each day, as if that was all he could be sure of. Maybe I wouldn't show up the next day, or I'd just completely disappear. He paid me a different amount each time. I guessed he was basing it on how he felt about whatever he earned for the day. He never cheated me, so his system worked out fine. I knew that in time he would stop doubting me, and I might even get a crack at chilling in the Atlantic Ocean on his big boat. Eventually, he took me on a tour of the world in Chinatown that existed beneath the dark brown metal doors in a cement ground. These doors, when unlocked, led to a network of basements. Downstairs from Cho's, there were tanks and cages filled with live, long, black eels, lobsters, crabs, chickens, pigeons, and even cats. A narrow cement underground pathway connected each business on the block to the other. Once we walked past his underground property, we entered the next man's underground space where he was storing unmarked box merchandise. Cho said, Stay on my side. He explained that the merchants on this strip had an honor system not to tamper with each other's products and a sure method of dealing with anyone who violated it. I knew what that meant. I had already peeped the short, bald, Chinese strongman, his body built like a rhinoceros. In the thick of the winter, he came around wearing only a t-shirt as the weather had no effect on him. He entered the shop every Friday, surrounded by his deadly silence, and collected an envelope from Cho. I didn't need to see any more than that to know there was some kind of army behind all of these Asian businesses and that the businesses were forced to pay out protection money. On the way back through the underground tour, Joe pointed out a cement shower stall located on his property with a high-powered water hose and adjustable shower head. He held up a big black bar of soap and said it was the only soap that gets every trace of the fish scent off your hands and body. He said, My wife hates the smell of fish, but loves to eat the fish. He laughed, a rare laugh, at his own joke. His laughter evaporated. Then he told me, This is your locker. Bring your own lock. He introduced me to the only cat in the underground who didn't have a price on her head. She was a black cat with gray eyes named Yisu. I asked him why only this one cat was roaming around freely. He said, so good. I checked it all out. I would bring my own lock. I was big on having a locker, a new stash spot, but I didn't plan on showering down there. After work every Friday and Saturday, I would just wash up in the upstairs bathroom to keep my face and hands clean. Then I would shower each time when I got home. It wasn't long before an incredibly unique-looking, young, dark-eyed Chinese girl started eyeballing me. She worked on the same side of the block as me, four stores down. I had seen her a couple of times on my way in, selling their merchandise, handbags, hats, and umbrellas. She was very pretty, with big, pear-shaped, dark eyes, high cheekbones, and very long, jet-black hair. Sometimes she wore it straight and sleek. Other times she wore it thick and wild. She was always fashionable with a crazy original clothing style. The things she wore were completely different from the items they were selling in her store. With the Asians in Chinatown, there was a big difference between the parents and the children. The youth were hip-hop style like us. 
She rocked Nike sneakers and always had a girl's style and colors i never seen for sale before. I suspected she was buying from the kids' sizes because her feet were really small. She seemed sneaky. I figured she was spending her whole lunch break walking back and forth, checking me out. She never came inside the store or bought any fish from Cho. I didn't know what her interest in me was about. I'd be there in my work boots or work kicks, loading and unloading trucks, sometimes wearing a rubber apron covered with fish scales. I liked her subtle mannerisms, like the slow way her eyes moved around trying to take a quick look, the way she once bit her lip when she caught me catching her staring, the swift way she walked away and disappeared like one of my two green-eyed Egyptian cats from back home named Kush and Kemet. Once she held her pretty hand against the store glass, the tips of her fingernails began glistening with the thin streak of her silver glitter she had painted on. I liked the crazy color combination she wore sometimes. The sh that everybody knows don't go together, but she wore them with such style and ease that she made it look like it was the thing to do. On a snow-filled winter afternoon, she was cashmere down in a cashmere tam, scarf, sweater, dress, and even cashmere sweater stockings. Her dark brown leather boots wrapped tight around her calves and climbed high up her leg, stopping just above her knee. She looked high quality, soft and warm. I could tell that she got at least some of her clothes from the Benetton shop in the village. I had seen a few pieces she wore on display in their window. No matter what she wore, though, she was always styling unlike anybody else. Very original with the clever accessories, sometimes strange hats, selective scarves, driving gloves, or a rough leather belt with an unusual buckle, or just a wicked odd-shaped handbag looking fresh and clean and chilling no matter what the weather or season. On a fog-filled rainy day once, she still showed up to check me. She was beneath a beautiful wooden, crimson Chinese umbrella. She was wearing assorted shades of red, beautifully woven and crocheted into a wicked patterned poncho. Her colors were so brilliant that day that they cut through the cloudiness and made her light up and stand out from everyone else who, because of the weather, all looked like black or gray globs, no matter who they were or what they had on. She didn't say nothing when she came around peeking. I could tell she was older than me, and I wondered if she ever considered that I was just 14. One afternoon when business was slow, I pointed her out to Cho. She was wearing burlap Gucci shorts in the freezing winter, with heavy wool tights covering her legs, a rough as leather belt with the Gucci interlocking G's, butter Tims, and a wool Applejack hat that matched her stockings. Cho quickly informed me that she was Japanese, not Chinese. He said there was a big difference between the two. He said he had only seen her around the block for less than six months. He said he didn't know her or her people. Akemi spoke again in Japanese. She said you're so beautiful. The other girl giggled. Akami blushed. How old is she? I asked her friend. She is 16. Her friend answered. Then she asked, How old are you? 14, I said, clocking their reactions. They spoke to each other. Akami looked a little disappointed. She says you are so tall for 14. Her friend translated. Tell her I said it's easy for me to be taller than her. Akami smiled returned. They stood there glancing at each other like they were trying to read each other's mind, then glancing back at me. I didn't know where to move with this. I was telling myself I'm good at getting money, fighting, and guns, but virgin with the girls. I don't know if she saw my age as an opportunity to switch things around and take control over me. She stepped in and touched my hand. 
her off-white skin and clean, unpainted fingernails today stroked me until an unfamiliar sensation ran up my arm and into my chest. She moved her fingertips into my palms that felt even better. She said some words to me in Japanese. Her soft, musical tone of voice got me hard. My mind was steady telling my body to calm down. She whispered something to her friend. Then her friend said to me, She hopes maybe sometimes you and her could go out for a walk and talk together like friends. I nodded yes and said okay. I was thinking the three of us might be going out together. Otherwise, me and Akami couldn't talk about this. Are you coming? I asked a friend. I can only come if you guys go tomorrow. I'm just here visiting Akami. I don't live in New York. On Sunday, I'm going back home, she said. Okay, tomorrow, I'll come by the umbrella stand around four, I told a friend. She looked surprised that I knew where Akami worked, as though she thought this whole thing just started when she showed up. I knew then that she had no idea how long Akemi had been checking me out. Oh, then you know where Akemi works, she laughed. I've seen her around, I said coolly. Then they spoke their language to each other. Don't come by the shop. Meet us at the bakery on Doyer. Do you know it? Her friend asked. Yeah, it's across from the movie theater. Cool. I watched as they turned and walked away. Walking to the subway, I thought about Akemi's powerful, dark eyes. The curve and structure of her face was so striking. Seeing her up close for the first time, I realized she was even more beautiful with her small nose and thick, pretty black girl lips. I guess it was the unknown that drew out my interest in her. The fact that she had staked me out for three months without ever speaking one word was sweet to me. The fact that each time I saw her, she was either alone or working. I couldn't just look at her and feel like I instantly knew everything about her the way I could with the females who lived on my block. They were either very loud and pushy or quiet but completely predictable either way. Everyone around our way knew which guys had already ran through them. They all had copycat styles, crazy attitudes, and ways of talking. Akemi's style was vibrant and unique, especially compared to some of the very plain-looking Asian females I seen coming and going in Chinatown. After one face-to-face -face meeting, she already had me feeling like I was on some type of adventure. After replaying our encounter in my head, I realized her friend never asked me my name. That works out better for me, I told myself. Since I've been living here, I discovered that Americans are either too impatient or too stupid to pronounce a name if it isn't common to them, like Bob or Dave or Jack. When my mother first took me up to school to get me registered, the people escorted us to meet my new teachers and classmates. When we got to the right room number, I handed a teacher my registration card. My name was clearly printed across the top of the paper. The teacher looked at it and announced, Welcome. Please introduce yourself to the class. I told them my full name, my first name. My father's first name, my grandfather's first name, which is customary in my home country. They all started roaring with laughter. One fat boy even spilled out of his chair and onto the floor. One girl, black skin like me, started shouting, Bonga Bonga! My mother tapped my shoulder and we both turned and left. At the time, my mother could not speak anything except Arabic. When we got away from the school, she asked me to tell her exactly what happened back there in that classroom without leaving one word out. I told her the short, simple story, which really had nothing to it. On the train, she sat silently for some seconds. Then she said, America, the land of the fatherless children.
We never returned to any public school. My mother said nothing good could come out of a school where praying is forbidden. She had me keep up my studies at home. This included math, science, English, Arabic, and the Quran. At first, I thought I was on a tight at home study schedule. Over the years, my mother rewarded my discipline by allowing me to freestyle. I read all kinds of books, some from the public library, some purchased at the Open Mind bookstore. I even used to watch people on the buses and trains reading. I would check the title of the book a person was holding, and if they looked really into it, I would check out that same title for myself. So when anyone in this country asks me my name, I tell them whatever comes to mind. Sometimes it's a short version of one of my five true names. Sometimes it's a name that has the same letters as one of my names, but all mixed up to spell something else. Sometimes it's a nickname, or just a name I want a certain person to call me. At our Brooklyn apartment that evening, I showered and got fresh dressed. My mother had her merchandise wrapped. She and my sister and I all ate dinner together. Afterward, I packed my backpack and left to do the Uma Designs product deliveries. As soon as I finished, I headed straight over to the dojo to meet my mans Amir and Chris. Amir lives in the East New York projects. Chris is from Flatbush and lives in the Brownstone. We all the same age. We all first met each other at the dojo on tryout day seven years back. I was surprised. They was the only boys who showed up with their fathers. I showed up for self. While most students had class once weekly, the three of us trained side by side three nights a week in ninjutsu. Despite being from completely separate neighborhoods, we became best friends. I think we all chose this martial arts school for similar reasons. It was authentic. Our teacher was actually from Japan, where the art form originated. He taught us things that were important to our survival and didn't feed us a lot of bullshit. I admit it, I admired that Sensei was a quiet man, but very deadly. He made it clear to each of us who survived his tryouts that he trained level-headed boys to become killers in the name of self-defense and at the highest level to become ninjas. He told us in his presentation that the difference between a samurai warrior and a ninja is a samurai is trained to carry out orders while a ninja is trained to think for himself, master flexibility, execute, and finish off his enemy. When I went to join up, there were about 35 kids who showed up and were trying out. After Sensei gave his no-nonsense introduction and the explanation of ninjutsu, some of their mothers grabbed their son's little hands, rushed out the door, and never returned. He had my full attention when he explained that unlike karate and other martial arts forms, his students did not compete in tournaments. He said fighters who train for tournaments become comfortable with predictable boundaries, limiting rules, particular styles, and planned scenarios. In the streets, he said, there is no courtesy or choreography. An enemy will do any and everything, and a ninja must not be locked into one particular style. He must always be flexible and prepared for the unexpected. He assured the students who took the training seriously that if we practiced hard and advanced, we would even be afforded the elite opportunity to learn weaponry. He told us to forget about belts. White belts, yellow belts, green belts, orange belts, red belts, black belts, they had no real meaning. When you become a master, the sensei and the student will both know and acknowledge. He said that only a fool would advertise his skills. It is much better to move quietly and be unrecognized by your opponent. Sensei promised we would learn the points on the human body that were easy to attack and difficult to defend. 
He told us that to finish off your opponent, there were several tidy techniques beyond the barrel of a gun. Sensei's students traveled from throughout the five boroughs to get his training. We were all drawn to Asian culture, the weapons, and fighting skills. Up until this point, Chris and Amir, who were always talking about girls, had never mentioned Asian women. I'm sure they would be surprised if I told them I would meet up with two Asian girls tomorrow. Usually, the three of us could speak about anything, but I already knew I would not tell them about Akemi. Deliveries completed. I was walking up the busy Brooklyn block on Friday night, headed for the dojo. I was checking my left side, my right side, and even using the eyes in the back of my head. But I was looking in the wrong direction when Amir leapt out from where he was crouched down in between two beat-up old cars. He attacked me. He used the handles from my own backpack to choke me. I ran my moves on him, using an elbow to the head, causing him to loosen his grip. I took advantage and made him fall backward. He broke his fall and charged forward. I was already in my stance, ready for his next attack. This young kid rolled up talking about, Oh, sh**! Oh, sh**! He appointed himself fight promoter and a small crowd gathered round, charged up to watch me and Amir kill each other. That time I struck first. There was a series of blows, strikes, and kicks. I got in a few and blocked some. He got in one real good shot to my chin. As abruptly as it all started, we stopped. Amir came down from midair and we just started walking. The crowd booed. They didn't know this is how we normally do. We had them all psyched. As usual, we argued all the way to the dojo about which one of us actually won this encounter. Soon as we reached the place, we saw Chris getting out of the back of his father's car. Friday nights were reserved for beginners, so we stayed out of the way in the dojo. After seven years of training there, on our nights off, we used it as a meet-up spot for us three, like a community center. Meanwhile, Sensei was patiently instructing a class of beginners. I wondered if we looked that out of balance and hopeless when we first began. Check this out. I met this cat Tyree who asked me about joining some basketball team that's jumping off over at Boys and Girls High School next Friday night. I told him, what you think about that? What about it? Chris asked. It's some games leading up to some tournament. Y'all want to get down with it? What's the stakes? Amir asked. I don't know, man. I didn't ask. We could hustle up more cash on our own unless they got some kind of real type prizes, Chris said. Yeah, we can't just put in all that work for just one big ass trophy and some bullshit ribbons and t-shirts, Amir added. You remember what happened when we won that peewee tournament? They only had one brass trophy for the whole team to share, Chris said. We all laughed. Yeah, I had to beat all of y'all down for that one. That's why that piece of junk is still at my house, Amir bragged. Nah, it's at your house because I didn't want it, I reminded Amir. We pushed through the dojo door laughing and cracking jokes behind Chris, who had his basketball. On the basketball court a couple of blocks over from the dojo, we three was known as the Shake and Take Boys because of how we put it down. At first, the Shake and Bake Boys used to run the court over that way, but we beat them enough times that we took their spot, their title, and their money. We wasn't the type of ball hustlers who pretended not to know one another, then beat other unsuspecting players out of their paper. We made it known that we worked together. We never let no other players come in and divide us or pick us onto their squad. If somebody wanted to battle us, they had to bring their three, because our three stayed the same. We three had balled on the same team at local parks for so long that our styles flowed together. I never had to worry about passing the ball and Chris not being on point. Chris had what the girls called the baby face. 
It must have been true, because other players used to underestimate him all the time. Double team me and leave him wide open. He could sink it way out from the deep wings of the court. So me and Amir used to feed him unpredictable and slick tag passes. He stayed alert, played great defense, got good looks, and didn't panic under pressure. Amir was nice and smooth with his three-pointers, plus mad nice with the layups also. He was a showman who was dedicated to making any of his moves look good. He liked to humiliate his opponents, which he did often. He hated punks who called fouls because he loved knocking players over and respected them more when they tried to knock him over too. If they wanted to fight about it, Amir used it as a chance to practice our fighting skills with untrained street fighters. Known for being completely silent on the court, the most swift, and for the way I handled the ball, anything the two of them couldn't do, I picked up the slack. Whenever a few dudes seen us running the court at the park, they came up with a challenge. Amir always sets up a bet. We always win. Niggas can't handle loss, even when it's fair and square. And the older the cats, the more they tend to bitch and moan. Most of the time, we three gotta fight. We didn't hesitate. We battled like Brooklyn. We held our own and collected our money. Chris was like our treasurer. He held on to the bulk of our winnings, minus a couple of slices of pizza and drink. We agreed that we was going to save up to buy a car when we all turned old enough to get our licenses. Chris wanted a Pontiac Sunbird. Amir wanted the Fiero GT. I had my eye on this me tiny pretty Porsche I saw at the dealer. Seriously though, we all knew that chances were we would end up dropping a few G's on a used bomb and taking turns driving or riding together. This night. The teens who showed up to challenge us didn't have no money. They rejected Amir's bet and wanted to play for fun. Amir laughed at their broke asses and told them to step off. They got tight about it because they had four girlies on the side holding their radio and waiting on them. These cats would not move off the middle of the court. Chris knew sh** was about to heat up, so he waved me and Amir over talking about, F*** it, let's bounce. There's no money here. Chris was like that. He would fight when pushed, but he tried to keep his fists down and profits up. Determined, Amir stepped up to them and said, We'll play you for your girls. I'm checking for the red bone anyway. If we win, they hang out with us for the night. If you win, we'll let you walk with 50 more dollars than you got right now. Amir smiled, waiting for their response. Chris took a good look at the girls and picked one for himself. The other dudes were standing there with their screw faces on, mumbling secrets back and forth to one another, vexed at the girls who were looking more and more like they were liking Amir's bold style. I took a couple of steps back so I could get a good look at them now to see where their hands was and what they was carrying in them pockets. The shortest dude among them threw up his hands and said, F*** it, let's run it. Matter of fact, make it a hundred dollars. Amir hollered, Deal. I had money in my pockets. Uma Designs money, which I just collected, was in my front pants pocket. My tips were in my inside jacket pocket. I always kept $500 in my right leg pocket in case of emergency. I didn't know if Amir and Chris had enough money on them. I knew Amir was the type who would place a big bet whenever he could pay it off or not. That's how sure he always was. As Amir took the ball back and checked it, the girls turned the volume up on LL Cool J's joint, Rock the Bells. Amir passed me the ball. Soon as I started bouncing the ball, Amir started talking shit to f with their minds. It's good y'all took the deal. Them girls was gonna leave y'all asses anyway, cause y'all ain't got no money. 
while the kid checking Amir let Amir's words take effect on him, I passed the ball back to Amir who laughed in their faces as he shook them and laid it up. They played hard and sweated a lot but seemed more focused on their anger than the hoops. Sensei always said, anger cancels good judgment. Soon as one of them reached in for the ball, I made it disappear. They didn't see it again until it was swishing through the net. That night, Chris was the high scorer. Amir was the showman who purposely messed with their minds. They couldn't f with us. We ran a full court three on three. In less than one hour, we took them down. Curse words hung over their heads like cartoon characters. Steam blew out their ears. The short one threw the ball against the fence way on the other side of the court. Then they made their move. Two of them went and threw their arms around their girls. The other grabbed his radio and tried to walk off. Shorty, Amir called out to the light-skinned one. Come here. She yanked herself from out of the other one's grip and turned back to look at Amir. Easily, she began walking over to our side. Get your ass over here! The other guy screamed on her. She didn't listen to him. Now she was all up on Amir and all of her girls had followed her over too. The three niggas charged us. Amir pushed the girls to the side and we all started brawling on the cement court. The girls started screaming and jumping up and down like excited cheerleaders. Their is bouncing up and their asses pulling them back down to the ground. Them boys got tired before we did. We could have fought all night. We left them on the ground and walked away with the four girls. The short motherfucker stood up, holding his head from the pain we put on him. He started hollering about the girl in the blue jacket was his sister. I figured he had to be lying because what would his sister be doing over here walking away with us? Quickly, I looked in her eyes. She didn't say she wasn't his sister. Matter of fact, she didn't say nothing. Go back over there, I told her. She sucked her teeth, stomped a foot, and went. Chris's lip was busted. We got a cup of ice from Mickey D's and kept it moving. Where we going? Amir's girl asked. Where y'all want to go? Chris answered. I don't know. Chris's girl responded. We can go to my house. The girl walking beside me said to everybody. You think we want to hang out with your mother at your house? Chris asked her sarcastically. She ain't home, the girl said in a bold voice. How can you be sure, Chris asked. Because she works all night in the toll booth at the bridge. She on her way to work right now, she said with complete confidence. All right, let's do this then, Amir said. Is your father home, I asked her. Everybody started cracking up. A bending over type of cracking up and laughing. No one bothered to answer my question. Don't worry, the girl said. We all kept walking, now following her lead to the subway. I felt I had to ask at least one more question. What about the niggas from back there? Do they live around your way? I asked. My boy stopped walking. They were getting focused now and waiting on her answer. I could see that Amir now understood where I was headed with my questioning. I wasn't one to walk into a setup. Why should we give them boys time to get locked and loaded? I didn't want to catch a case on some bullshit. Them niggas, the red bone asked, as if she wasn't just associated with them five minutes ago. We don't know them niggas, Chris's girl added, then laughed. We met them on a train ride up here, the girl walking beside me said. Chris and Amir were cool with their answers. They all started walking together again. I gotta work early tomorrow morning. I'll ride over there with y'all, but then I gotta step, I told them. What about me? The girl walking beside me asked. What about you? I answered her, straight-faced. Forget it, you ain't right, she said back. On the train ride, me and her didn't say nothing to each other. 
we elevated to the fourth floor. In the upstairs hallway in front of apartment 4G, she moved her hands in and out of her back pants pockets and then her front pockets, searching for keys. Chris and his girl and the other two was laying up against the wall waiting. I pulled out my 4-5 and handed it to Amir. Let me let you hold something, I told him. He took it. Good looking out, brother, he said. All the girl's eyes followed my gun. The one fumbling with her keys started staring into my eyes so hard she was melting my pupils. Come on, bitch, her girlfriend nudged her jokingly. She found her keys, lost through a hole inside her jacket pocket. As she opened her door, they all pushed inside. She stood holding the door open for me. I turned my back to her and pushed through the metal exit door leading to the stairs. I took the four flights down. I left out the side of the building, switched up my path. Chapter 12 The next morning, I was prepared. Saturdays always brought in a heavy flow of customers. Some people realized that fresh seafood is always delivered on Friday. So on Friday, I spent a lot of time unloading and moving boxes and barrels and buckets. And Saturdays, I spent a lot of time scaling, cutting, clipping, and gutting fish. Routinely, on those kinds of days, I covered my head with a bandana. I put on some welding glasses that I used to keep fish scales and particles from flying into my eyes. I had all my work clothes, a raincoat, and an apron on top of that. I'm sure I was looking crazy and exaggerated, but I was quick and thorough at my job. Around three o'clock, I washed down my counter. I headed down to the basement. I had brought and stored a change of clothes and some other items in the locker. Since I was going to meet the girls, I was going to take advantage of the convenience of the basement shower stall for the first time. The water was good and hot, but the air underground and the floor was both freezing. I guess Cho never had to worry about anybody trying to live down there since it was more freezing than outside. Fresh, I spotted Akami even when I was halfway down the block from the bakery. It was the way she stood up in those hills. For the first time, I noticed that Nikes on a female's feet don't have the same magic as heels do. As I came up close, I saw she was wearing a black pleated miniskirt. Her shapely thighs were covered with wool tights that hid her flesh but revealed the curve of her legs. She was wrapped tight in the black butter leather jacket, well tailored to fit her shoulders exactly and ride down the curve of her waistline, hugging her hips gently. Her black leather gloves were tucked inside the belt that held her jacket closed. Her black epi leather handbag was dangling on the tips of her pretty fingers. Konnichiwa, I calmly gave them their greeting. Akemi smiled and the other one giggled. Um, yesterday, we forgot to ask your name, the other girl said. I looked at Akemi, who was looking at me as though her dark eyes could see beyond my face and into my soul. Midnight, I answered. I figured that was the name to give. I had seen some Chinese movie where every character had a hot ass name. And I knew a lot of Asian names were rooted in the weather, seasons, and the elements. Mayonaka, the other girl translated. Mayonaka, Akami said, serious-faced, with a curl of smoke swirling around her pretty lips from when her breath mingled with the cold air. Now I understood that Mayonaka meant midnight in Japanese. For some reason, the way Akami pushed out this one word warmed me up like crazy. Are you too hungry? I asked them. Her girl translated my question. No, she's nervous. Her friend translated. Ask her what she's so nervous about. She's the one who wanted to kick it. Tell her I would never hurt her. I was looking directly at Akami when I spoke my words. 
She was looking right back at me with those big, dark eyes. She didn't seem nervous to me, and I could feel the pull I had on her. Akemi says you look handsome. Tell her to tell me that herself, I responded. The girl gave her my message. Akemi lowered her eyes, then lifted them again slowly and spoke to me in her language. Her voice was soft. The flow of her words sounded like the seductive whispers of Sade on her Diamond Life album. The soft way she spoke, I had to listen carefully and focus on her hard and block out the regular noises of the New York City streets with the buses, taxis, horns, and hordes of people moving in every which direction. A thought came over me real quick. I wanted to take Akemi out, just me and her. The extra girl was helpful, but she had a different feel to her. She interrupted the strong, silent signals moving back and forth between me and Akemi. Ask Akemi if she can hang out with me on her own. The girl looked disappointed, but she translated my question anyway. Akemi answered with a bright <laughs> smile. What time does she have to be back? I asked a friend. Our aunt and uncle will close the gate to their store at 7 p.m. If she wants to ride back with us, she should be back by then. If it's later than 7 p.m., she has to go straight to Jackson Heights, Queens, where they live. She should be back no later than 10. I'll tell them she went shopping. If she goes past 10.30, it will be a lot of trouble for her, she said. Now I realized that the two of them were related. Then they began talking Japanese to each other. I watched Akemi's mouth moving as well as her facial expressions to gauge her reactions. I could tell she was with it. Okay, I'll go back to the store then. Are you sure you two will be okay? Akemi's cousin asked reluctantly. Everything is cool. She'll be home on time. Don't worry, I told her. Oh, and she's an art student. That's what she likes, her cousin said as she turned to walk away. I knew I could have asked her cousin all those questions about who Akemi is and what she liked. She would give me quick responses in her clear American accent. But I wanted to find out for myself what Akemi was all about. Besides, I was attracted to Akemi's Japanese accent, which sounded so much sweeter in my ear. I figured she knew all about Chinatown and Asian things and I could tell that she liked me and wanted to get to know me better. So I decided not to stick around there. I would just bring her into my world to see how she reacts and handles that. It was the end of February. The cold air made us move more swiftly. I saw the bright orange, powerful sun overpowering the light blue sky, but throwing its heat to the other side of the world. I could see the cold air lingering around Akemi's lips as she breathed in and out as if she was actually smoking a cigarette. But she wasn't. I slowed down a bit and watched the way she moved. She turned to see what I was doing behind her and smiled when she thought she knew. I picked up my step and she walked behind me from that afternoon into the night. We hopped on a number six train from Chinatown to 125th Street in Harlem. From the look on her face, it seemed like everything she saw of town was brand new. First stop was the record store. I wanted to pick up a couple of joints. The owner of the shop was from South Africa. He had a cool vibe, so whenever I was in the area, I threw some business his way. When we walked in, he was playing music by Miriam Makiba. Akemi seemed to like it. Her head was rocking to the beat. Her little foot was tapping on the floor. Look around, I told her and gestured with my arm. The store owner switched the vibe and threw on salt and pepper, the showstopper. When I was ready to go, she had one record in her hand. It was Eric B. and Rakim, their first joint. Eric B. is president. I flipped the album around in my hand, checking out the cover. Recently, I had heard that hot joint rocking around my way on a tape. 
The beats were crazy, and the rhymes just reminded me of my Brooklyn block of all the characters, situations, and everyday happenings. I can understand how somebody who never lived around my way might buy this joint to make themselves feel like they was walking in my hood. But then again, really walking through my hood would be a reality check for anybody who didn't live there. I bought her Hot, Cool, and Vicious, the Salt and Pepper album, and paid for everything, and we stepped. I needed a lineup. I took her to a barber shop where I only got a cut two or three times before. I told her to sit down. She did, but within seconds, she stood right back up. She preferred to look around. She might as well walk around staring at everything because everybody in the shop was definitely staring at her. As I'm getting my cut, she's watching me watching her through the mirror. Sometimes she would disappear from my sight because I had to hold my head still for the cut. The barber, with his back to her, asked me, That's you, man? Referring to Akemi. That's me, I answered. She's different. She's bad, the barber acknowledged. There was something I had to get used to in this country. Men commenting on the next man's woman. Back home, this was a wrong move unheard of. Out here in the U.S., this was common. After he hit me with a fresh cut, the brush, and the talcum powder, I paid and tipped the barber. When I turned around, Akemi was holding a handful of my hair in her palm. What are you doing? I asked her, also gesturing with my hands. She just smiled. She opened her purse and dumped my hair inside a small, nicely crafted, embossed tin box she had with her for some reason. She closed the top on the box and dropped it into her purse. She held up her finger as if to say, Wait one minute. She went into the bathroom and washed her hands with the door wide open. In the footlocker, she stood staring at the kid's rack, just like I thought. She purchased a kid-sized pair of white Nike Uptowns. I bought some dunks, too. It was bugged out being with her. There was almost no talking, but a lot of eye contact and signaling. On the streets, she grabbed my hand from behind to stop me from walking farther. She wanted to turn into the Mart, an indoor black version of some of the outdoor flea markets in Chinatown. She walked into each stall one by one, starting with the art stores, which were up front. There were several paintings of and by African Americans for sale. She flipped through each painting quickly, then paused on a particular one. I watched her run her finger slowly across the surface of one picture, feeling the texture the same way I would imagine a blind person would do. In the jewelry stall, she wanted her ears pierced. She bunched her hair up and held it with her hand so the woman could see her ears clearly. What captured me were her fingers. I noticed how on each of her natural fingernails, she had one Japanese letter painted on it in black. Each fingernail glistened as each letter was coated with a layer of clear polish. The woman placed a dot on each of Akami's ears with a marker. Akami gave me a glance. I knew she wanted me to hold her hair for her, so I did. It was soft and very long and felt good in my hands. Her face looked even prettier, her profile now not hidden by her hair. I stood looking at her neck. She squinted when the jewelry gun pinched her piercings into place. Her eyes filled up with water, but no tears. I tied her hair up into a slit knot and left it that way. She seemed to like it. She rocked it that way for the rest of the night. In the airbrush booth, she pulled her new uptowns out of the footlocker bag and cracked open the box. She wanted her joints spray painted. She looked through the vendor's art book for a sample of what kind of design she wanted him to put on her sneakers. After a while, she couldn't find one she liked. She pulled out her wallet and laid her cash on the counter. 
She picked up the airbrush gun to gesture that she wanted to paint them herself. Nah, she can't do that, the cat told me. Take your money. Let her try. She's an artist. She adjusted the nozzles and started painting her own sneakers. The designs she was making had thinner lines than the design samples the guy showed us. She got intricate with it. It took only seconds to see she was real nice with her hands. She used only one color, black. When she was through with one sneaker, the guy was asking me if she wanted a job. When she finished her second sneaker, the next customer was trying to get her to stay and do hers next. Outside, the orange sun was replaced by the white moon. The blue sky gave in to the black night. There were very few stars shining in Harlem, yet there were a few trying to break through. It was clear and cold. The sidewalk vendors lined the whole of 125th Street. The people were still out walking, talking, dancing, and kept it moving. I was feeling hungry. We walked across 7th Avenue. Akimi's eyes searched the buildings, into the windows, empty lots, churches, and alleys. We ended up at a spot named the Jamaican Hot Pot. We sat down at a table. I ordered chicken curry for her and stewed chicken for me. In the men's room, I washed my hands and face. It didn't look or seem dirty, but every New Yorker knows when you ride the trains and walk the New York City blocks, the dirt just accumulates. I bought a wet napkin back to our table and cleaned Nakami's hands. Her fingers were slim and soft and relaxed into mine. She just sat watching me intensely. When she first tasted the curry sauce, the scotch bonnet pep made her eyes fill with water again. She ate some of the chicken and all of the cabbage and carrots. While sipping on some carrot juice, she began to draw a picture on a white cloth napkin, using an unusual marker with a long point shaped like a paintbrush. After some strokes, I was surprised how I could really see my own resemblance in her drawing. She held the cloth up and drew a smile out of me. Then she laid the cloth out flat, went into a purse, and pulled out a thin-tipped red marker. In quick, artistic strokes, she wrote in Japanese letters down the right side of the cloth, Mayonaka Hansamu, she said, looking at me dead in my eyes. I could feel her admiration pouring down all over me. It felt good. It relaxed me a bit and drew me in further. The red Japanese letters against the white napkin looked wicked to me. I wanted to keep the drawing, but she folded the cloth up and put it in her purse. By now, I figured that's where she kept most of her secrets. I paid our bill. Yvonne, the Jamaican owner of the restaurant, gave me the mean look. I gave her an extra tip for the cloth Akami took. I'll admit, the whole while we were walking back down 7th Avenue, I was thinking about myself. Here it was Saturday night, and for the first time ever, I was on a date for self with a female. I knew it wasn't supposed to be happening, but I made myself feel all right by staying in public places with her, not doing anything I or anyone could consider improper. On 116th Street in Harlem, on the steps of Columbia University, I sat her down. It was a nice spot, especially at night. They kept bright white holiday lights on their maple and oak trees all year round. The bright lights lit up the inside courtyard. Students from all around the country and all around the world and New Yorkers moved back and forth and sideways across the campus from building to building, some of them chilling on top of statues, some of them chilling behind statues, some of them seated to the side on the steps with their books piled up next to them. Others were gripping hot cups of coffee or buying hot cocoa or tea. This was a place I came every now and then because this was a place where my father had been and spent a lot of time studying and socializing. 
I would sit here alone sometimes, thinking of answers to my own questions first. Then I would think of what my father's answers and suggestions would be. Sometimes I would wonder if I was standing in the same space where he had actually stood several years ago. Ake and me did not seem to mind our silent date, but now I really did have things I wanted to ask her. So I just started talking aloud to her as if she could understand me. How are you feeling right now and what are you thinking? I asked her in English. She watched my lips. There was a pause. Then she started speaking to me in Japanese. Of course, I couldn't understand one word. I realized she didn't understand my question either. So why did you watch me for three months before you finally said something? I asked her. When I finished speaking, she began speaking Japanese again. What were you looking at anyway? And why do you like me? I asked her. Then she spoke Japanese again. Do you have a boyfriend? Have you ever been touched by a man? I asked, feeling comfortable speaking this way to her because I knew she couldn't understand me. She said something else back to me in her language. What do you want anyway? I asked her. She began laughing a little. Then she kept laughing a lot. Her shoulders were shaking. I started laughing too. I don't know when I last laughed so hard. This shit was crazy, I thought to myself, but I like her. I like her a lot. Damn, I wish you could speak English, I said, laughing and frustrated. She stood up and smiled deviously, put her hands on her hips, and said, Speak Japanese. I stood up and pulled her by her hand. Her palms were soft like butter and warm. Over at the vendors, I bought her a Columbia University hooded sweatshirt. When I gave it to her, she smiled like I had given her a brick of gold. She went into her purse once more and came out with a folded shopping bag. As she opened up each square of the bag, I could see that it was made with beautiful decorated heavy paper with gold twine for handles. I thought to myself how she seemed to be a female who plans and thinks ahead. Everything she wore and possessed, down to the smallest items, seemed to be carefully chosen. She paid close attention to details and preferred everything she wore, used, and surrounded herself with to be unique. It added to her elegance. She placed the Columbia hoodie into her shopping bag. At five minutes to ten, on a queen's corner in a tree-lined residential neighborhood of medium-sized houses, we stood still in the dark. She was looking up at me. I was looking down at her. She stepped inside my leather jacket, standing close to my body, but not touching it. I didn't need my jacket no more, because in the cold air, my body was consumed with heat. She reached up and touched my face like I was one of the African paintings whose texture she wanted to feel. Her fingers settled on my lips. I didn't move. When I walked through the door, my mother took one look at me and said, You met a girl. I tried to play it off. It was crazy how she always just calmly stated the truth. She didn't even bother to put it in the form of a question. It was like she already knew and didn't need me to confirm or deny. Stalling, I took off my jacket and loosened my laces, stepping out of my nikes. No matter how long I delayed, I knew I could never escape Uma's intuition. My seven years young sister laughed at how easily I was exposed. I met two girls, I said, telling the truth but trying to throw her off. Which one of them made your face light up this way? She asked. What about my face? I dodged. Uma smiled and stood staring. I knew no matter what I said, this conversation would end up meaning the world to her. She was clear and strong in her Islam, a Muslim woman of the highest degree. Uma never lowered her standards. She considered America the land of women with no honor. So I chose my words carefully. She just came into this country six months ago. She does not speak any English. I met her at work. We are friends, I said to Uma, speaking only in Arabic. My sister Naja hung on every syllable, fully aware of Arabic and English. 
You are leaving some things out on purpose, Uma said coolly and confidently. What things? I dodged again. She's not a Muslim, or you would have said that she was. She is very beautiful to you, and that's why the light is spilling out of your eyes. You three are friends for now, but you already know that one of the two girls is very special. I just hugged Uma instead of offering her my words. My sister wiggled her way in between us, and that was okay, too. It was late Saturday night. In our family embrace, I said to Uma, Akami. Her name is Akami. Uma repeated softly, Akami. Alone in my warm bedroom, I dashed my window open to bring in a stream of cold air. As I did my push-ups, voices from the streets below also came rushing through. My thoughts spanned from Uma to Akimi, from New York to the Sudan, Islam to the unbelievers. Surely I know who I am. Yet the reality is I am living here. I am young. The niggas on the streets consider religion a trick and a weakness. The believers are seen as the duped and the hustled. The Holy Quran, which is the absolute law where I was born, is nothing more than unknown or useless poetry in the eyes and ears of American youth. I already knew from listening to and observing these American chicks, they don't give a f about female honor. They f any random stranger who looked good to them and switched boyfriends like they changed their hairstyles. They definitely gave less than a f about marriage. It wasn't even a consideration. In the Quran, I read an ayat in a surah that said, Allah knows the count on your womb. In Islam, it mattered a lot if a woman lay down for a man, her relationship to him, and under what circumstances. In the Quran, it was forbidden for an unmarried female to lay with an unmarried male and vice versa. In the Quran, every detail was written clear and simple for true believers to follow and limit themselves. On the other hand, here in the United States, a man gets no respect unless he bangs and twists those females out right away. I consoled myself. The difficult position I was in, being from there, living here, remembering and believing, and over the years, seeing nothing outside of my little family that reflected my memories or beliefs. Number one, ayat is a sentence or line. Number two, surah is a chapter. Chapter 13 Guns and girls. I keep them separate. Amir showed up to the dojo Monday night with red bone on his arm. Me and Chris was looking at him sideways because, as a rule, we didn't bring spectators during our training. Even though every now and then there were times when I had no choice but to bring my little sister Naja, I thought, or I should say me and Chris thought, Amir's move was a mistake. First off, since he turned 12, Amir been girl crazy. Me and Chris watched him act like he had fallen in forever love with about 18 different females. The girls were all crazy about him too, so it was cool. But we knew from experience that he shouldn't bring girls who he knew he was gonna break up with to any of our permanent hangouts. He already had a female named Sophia turn stalker on his ass. Wish with her got so serious, even Sensei had to step in. When any one of the three of us did anything wrong, we all got the pressure from Sensei, the same as if we all had done the wrong thing together. Sensei told us in private that it wasn't enough to master the fighting technique. We had to master our desires for women before the women master you. I looked at Amir all wrapped up with red bone. Long weekend, I joked. Me and Chris both laughed. 
Our training takes a lot of concentration. Out on the floor, we stretched and worked on katas and rollouts. Later, we sparred as sensei's demand. He kept the fight scenarios flipping like a quarterback calling out complicated plays. He never allowed us to get used to one sparring partner. I knew I would be out on the floor sparring one opponent. Next thing I knew, I was surrounded by three more attackers. For half an hour, I would be in the defending position. The next half hour, I would be one of the attackers. Some of the fighters and students in our dojo were our age. Others were full-grown men. The challenge kept my blood pumping. Through it all, I kept feeling Redbone's eyes moving on me. I wanted to believe I had her wrong, but I knew I had her right. Toward the end of the season, me and Chris sparred each other while Amir and a next student sparred also. When our class finished up, I pulled Amir and Chris to the side. You got my piece? I asked Amir. Nah, but we could go pick it up now, he answered. Nah, bring it here Wednesday night when you come. But don't bring her, I told him. She's cool, Amir said nonchalantly about Redbone. Yeah, she's cool in any place except the dojo, all right? I asked, but it wasn't really a question. She wants to get your phone number anyway, Amir said casually. What? Chris jumped in before I could even make sense of what Amir was asking me. Then Amir started laughing. Don't be stupid. She wants your telephone number so she can give it to homegirl from the other night. The three of them are used to doing everything together. Anyway, homegirl got a thing for you, for real. She asked me for your number so many times yesterday, I almost f***ed around and gave it to her. I thought about how you be running your life like you some kind of secret agent. Nobody can come to your house or call your crib at certain times and all that bullsh**. Him and Chris laughed. Home girl is kind of cute, though, Chris said. She got a pretty face and a tight little waist. And thick thighs, Amir added. I was going to take her at first, but there's something so sexy about Redbone. She had the mother to beat hands down, Amir joked and bragged. If I wanted her to know my phone number, I'd have given it to her in that same night. Just bring my shit here on Wednesday. You didn't leave it at her house, did you? I asked, growing tight about Amir not being on point when all it takes is one little puff. Come on, man. Stop trying to play me, Amir answered, getting vexed. Chris jumped in to cut up the unusual tension. He always had a way of calming things down whenever he thought it was necessary. Look, you ain't gotta be serious with this girl. Just hang out with her while me and Amir keep the other two busy. That's how these girls want it, three on three. Make it easy on us, man. He smiled, trying to get me to lighten up. I looked at the both of them, considering the way they was begging me to get with some girl. All of a sudden, Amir's facial expression changed. He busted out laughing. A complete switch in his mood. I got you, nigga. You already got a girl. That's what's up. Amir called it out. You got a girl for the first time, and now she got you open. You just ain't saying shit about her. So now you don't want to f*** with home, girl. I should have figured it out before. That is the type of brother you are. He laughed some more. There was a short pause before he offered some more of his take on the situation. That's how you do it, man. One at a time, huh? Amir leaned in and teased, while Redbone, who we told to stay over there, was slowly creeping closer and closer to the area we were standing. Well, let me tell you something, Amir said to me. You got two eyes, two ears, two hands, two legs, two feet, ten motherfucking fingers, and ten motherfucking toes. Now Chris was relieved, too, and laughing again. I never answered Amir or Chris. My smile at Amir's words just cut through naturally. See you Wednesday night, I told him. Realistically, I didn't consider I could meet my girl. But in between the hundreds of things I had to do, I found her popping up in my thoughts and remaining there. I planned to see her at the end of the week again when I went back to my weekend job at Cho's on Friday. 
but now my thoughts of her were turning into an unfamiliar craving. I was feeling like a week was too long. On Wednesday, I made two Manhattan Uma Designs deliveries. So afterward, I decided to stop by Akami's family shop and check her. I was not sure if she even worked on Wednesdays, but I was about to find out. I wanted a chance to see what was up with her family. I got curious why her cousin said for me not to show up there at their family store. I found myself catching feelings for Akami. I had to be sure she wasn't trying to diss me by keeping me away from her relatives, her job, and her home. As I came up the subway steps onto the sidewalk in Chinatown, I joined the heavy New York crowds of walkers. One block down, as I turned the corner, I saw Akemi walking in the crowd headed in my direction. It was a gray day. She was wearing a designer scarf on her head, with the rest of her long hair falling onto her back. The pretty pastel colors made her glow. She had on a cobalt blue patent leather trench coat, trench style jacket today. It was close fitting, hugged her shoulders and laid across her breasts with a belt drawn tight against her small waist. Jeans and another new pair of Nikes with dark blue soles helped her to step lively through the dirty New York streets. She didn't see me approaching and seemed lost somewhere in her own thoughts. I wondered if I walked right past her, would she notice? Tucked underneath her arm, secured in her pit, was a large portfolio. In her other hand was a small purse. It matched her jacket and dangled from her fingers on a short handle. Within seconds, I walked right by her in an uneven crowd of nine or so people who just happened to be moving in the same direction. I didn't look back. Three seconds later, she grabbed my wrist. When I turned, she had a penetrating look and a warm, welcoming smile on her face. She pointed to her watch. She gave me the come on sign with her hand. I didn't know where she was going, yet I followed. Back down in the subway, we were on the downtown platform waiting for the trains headed to Brooklyn. This worked out for me. I had almost two hours left before I needed to be at the dojo. As the train jerked, she loosened up her jacket and pointed to her t-shirt. It had the words Pratt Institute written across it in bold letters. I didn't know where or what that was. I knew enough to know she was trying to say that that's where she was going. Staring into her dark eyes, I thought about how I had to teach my mother English word by word. It's been years now, and Uma can listen and understand more English than she can actually speak. She still only speaks a few words and sentences in English. I thought to myself that Akemi could probably learn the English language faster than my mother because my mother didn't really care for English. Akemi seemed eager to learn. She definitely was not allowing not knowing the English language to keep her from learning how to travel around the city and go exploring. I touched her hands. Now her fingernails were painted all of the pastel colors of her scarf. She looked me in my eyes. I said hand. I held up my hand and repeated the word hand one more time. She caught on easily, smiled and said, Hand. For the rest of the ride, we learned each other this way. Me touching her hand, fingers, arm, hair, ears, eyes, nose, and even lips. Then teaching her the right words to repeat and remember. She would touch me back and recite the right words out loud. I don't know if she was really learning English, but I knew we were learning each other. We got off in downtown Brooklyn. It was crazy how in the winter you could go down in the subway in the light of day and in less than a half an hour walk up into the dark of night. We ended up over on Willoughby Avenue at Pratt Institute. There was a bunch of people there, all in a hurry, young but older than both me and Akami. I noticed a lot of females dressed in varying styles. It seemed like they'd made up themselves. Some of that shit worked, and some of it looked a fucking mess. 
As she led her way to her classroom, I stopped right outside the door. She grabbed my hand and pulled it towards herself as if to say, Come in. I didn't come. I pulled back and said, Sayonara, the word she used the other night in Queens to separate herself from me. She reached out for my hand again and bowed to me. Her head was down. Then she lifted her eyes up and fixed them on my face. To see her bow to me gave me a crazy heated feeling. I followed her in, knowing I could only stay for a little while. On one side of the huge class, there were chairs with desks attached to them and a blackboard. On the other side were a bunch of easels, paints, brushes, and pencils, and papers of various sizes and types. I sat at the desk next to hers. At six o'clock sharp, a young woman who walked in with the authority of a teacher entered and stood at the front of the class. She talked some. I wasn't really listening to her. Instead, I was inside my head thinking about how I could go to a school like this with grown-up people who minded their business and just showed up to learn. I liked the way the class was taking place in the evening and people seemed like they came because they wanted to and not because they were being forced. I noticed her moving toward me. This slim white woman with brown hair, the teacher. Are you our model for today? She asked. I know I've seen your face before, she said, focusing everyone's attention on me. I didn't know what she was talking about or what she even wanted. I'm just here for a minute. I'm a friend of Akimi's. Matter of fact, I'm about to leave right now. I stood up. Akimi stood up. The teacher faced Akimi. It's okay, Akimi. I understand. He's a friend of yours. We won't address him then. The class laughed. Akimi didn't. But I'm sure I've seen that face before. It's a fantastic face, not to mention your body. You should consider modeling. The teacher reached out to touch my chin. Akami stepped in between the teacher's hand and myself. Everybody in the classroom knew what that meant. Some of the students laughed. One of the males said, ooh, and the teacher moved on. A female rushed through the door, out of breath. I'm your model for today, she proclaimed. The teacher looked at her watch and said, For $25 an hour, you should be on time. Sorry, the girl apologized, went to the other side of the room, and climbed onto the table. The teacher clapped her hands together and said, All right, people, let's set up. The students all got out of their chairs slowly and into their smocks. Akemi lagged behind a bit. I guess she needed to follow what the other students were doing. She, she couldn't understand her teacher's English words. Glad that the attention was now off me, I turned to leave. I looked at Akimi, who was standing in front of a cubby, putting on her smock. I pointed at the clock on the wall to signal and let her know I had to go. As I started to walk out, the girl model who had rushed in late, standing now on the table, casually pulled off her sweater and revealed her flesh, her neck and shoulders, her bare titties that went from white to pale pink to pink only to be topped off with purple slim. What a creation, shaped so exquisitely. My eyes then rolled down between her breasts and onto her soft, flat stomach, then sank into her darkened belly button. All I knew was I wasn't leaving no more. My legs weren't moving. Swiftly, she untied her wraparound denim skirt. There were no panties on that p just a choke of sandy blonde hair. The teacher began instructing the model on how to pose properly. As the model tried to get herself into a position that pleased the teacher, she turned slowly, showing everyone her bare back and butt. She bent over, the crease in her behind whined some. Then she kneeled and eventually squatted, cocking her legs open, a slight scent escaping and awakening my already precise sense of smell. The students, eight males and ten females, whose backs were all to me, faced their easels and the model. Nobody was saying nothing. They took her newness like for them it was an everyday thing. Now the teacher was back on my case. 
You're welcome to stay, she said to me sarcastically with a sly smile and her arms folded across her chest. The students turned toward my direction and began laughing once again. Akami, with a brush in her hand, just watched me closely with no judgment, simply observing my every move and maybe trying to read my thoughts. The intensity of her eyes unfroze my feet. Swiftly, I left. In the cold breeze, I broke out in a hot sweat. This was the first time I had ever saw a completely naked woman up close and in real life in all of her details. There was no doubt that I felt what I saw. I started thinking crazy thoughts. Like how come a girl can have straight hair on her head and nappy hair on a piece of or red hair on her head and a blonde pill between her thighs? And if this is how good a white girl looked naked with a small, soft-looking white behind, then what did the black females who hips were wider, breasts more juicy, this hat more bigger, looked like fully exposed? I kept seeing images of the gap between the girl's legs when I looked at her from the back. Every time I thought about it, I would never see the model's face or even remember what her face looked like or the shape of her nose or color of her eyes. I just kept seeing her body parts one by one, like a slideshow in my mind. Before the dojo, I dipped into the arcade. I played a few games of Street Fighter to try to get my mind back in the right position. There was no way I would be able to concentrate otherwise. The whole scene back there reminded me of something Uma once said concerning why me and Naja were not allowed to have a television in our Brooklyn apartment. She said, No outsiders should control what my children see. Once you show a child certain things, you can never snatch that image back. I remember thinking that she was being too strict. Now I at least understood what she meant. Luckily, when I was 13, after the fast of Ramadan, she bought me a television as a present. She said, There is nothing in this box that isn't happening right in front of you on these streets. You are becoming a man now. I have to believe that your father and I have raised you to separate yourself from evil. Naja, on the other hand, was still not allowed to watch. She was only five then. Your sandwich is in the bag, Amir said, handing me what I knew was my joint. I put it in my gym bag and locked it in the locker in the dojo. After our training, me, Chris, and Amir hooked up. As we chilled in the back of the dojo, Sensei rolled up and asked me to step inside his office. Chris and Amir looked surprised. Sensei had never singled one of us out before. If one of us f***ed up, we were all expected to hear about it. It's your time now. I know you're ready, Sensei said calmly. He was standing behind his desk. His seven words hung one beneath the other, mounted on the wall behind him. His deadly hands and knuckles gripped the edge of his desk. I wasn't sure what he was getting at. I knew not to interrupt whatever it was he had to say. Your weapons training will begin next week, he continued, searching for my reaction. Domo arigato, sensei. I responded in my very limited Japanese, thanking him very much in the respectful way that we were taught to speak to an elder, teacher, and master. I was showing no emotion, but was very excited inside. Learning the Asian-styled weapons is what had drawn me here in the first place. But Sensei's stringent standards and expectations were high and had kept him from teaching us weapons for the past seven long years. I felt good that he thought we were now prepared. We had all trained so hard. Over the years, me and Amir had never missed a practice. Chris missed practice every now and then because his father is a reverend who sometimes made demands on Chris's time. Just you, Sensei said, as if he could read my thoughts. My other two students are not ready yet. His words hit me hard. I stood still, weighing Sensei's words in my mind. Chris is still a follower. Amir is a strong fighter, but he has a lot of work to do on his discipline, Sensei judged. 
I thought about how in all of these years, us three never allowed anyone to say anything f***ed up about each other without a fight. I was trying to accept that this conversation and criticism of my two best friends was not meant to be an attack on them that required my loyalty or my foot to the face or head of the man who was my teacher. Sensei and I had a few rough times like this one before. Sometimes we disagreed. When I first joined up, he taught us how the Japanese bow as a matter of respect, but I did not bow. It is against my beliefs. For the first two years, Sensei was bitter and sore because he felt I was being arrogant and stubborn. Four more years later, he realized that I had no personal disrespect toward him or his culture, but I had loyalty to my beliefs and the lessons of my father. When you were a very young man, the first time you walked in here, you asked to see my sword. What did I tell you then? Sensei asked. Remembering clearly, I answered, You said that a sword is not something you can just see and hold or play with. You said the sword was an extension of a fighter's spirit. You said that when you draw your sword, it must be used. You said that every man must think before he draws his weapon. To draw it is to decide on death. Very good, Sensei said. And for this reason, I have chosen to train you in weapons. I have watched you. You retain information that others forgot. You have developed very nicely. I know that you have become a great fighter and independent thinker. I know that you are not a predator and will not abuse the knowledge that I will offer to you. You now show the discipline, the focus, and have the mind to become a great defender and protector of life. After a long pause in which Sensei sat down and began looking at one of the many papers on his desk, he said to me without looking into my eyes, You don't have to decide anything here tonight. If you want to train in weapons, come next week on Tuesday at 12 noon. Your friends will be in school. Hopefully you will be here with me, one on one. Hi, arigato sensei-san, I responded even more respectfully. Outside, curiosity kept Chris and Amir waiting on me. What happened? What did Sensei say? Chris asked. Amir waited intensely. Sensei said he is ready to train me in weapons, I admitted solemnly and truthfully. There was just silence. I knew they felt tight about it. Don't worry. Whatever I learn, I'll teach it to you. You know how we do, I promised. Whatever. Funny how he picked you for the weapons class. You already walk with your heat. What could be better than that? Chris asked, still feeling cheated. No, don't sleep, Amir said in a serious tone. Sensei knows a thousand different ways to kill a man. You never know when you might have to defend yourself using more than your hands and feet and can't get to your peace. We stood there, thinking about what Amir just said. F*** it, we trust you. You on our team, right? Amir patted me on the back and laughed. Chris's tension broke up. I looked at the two of them. I was grateful to have two friends in this foreign country. I thought of how my father's American friend and former roommate had left us stranded at the damn airport. I hoped that what we three had was something completely different. Ten o'clock that same night, back on my Brooklyn block, the guns were clapping. I moved swiftly to my building, dodging and avoiding, imagining my mother and sister ducked down on the floor the way I taught them to do when they hear gunshots. I was certain that my mother had the blinds closed and curtains drawn by this hour. Hopefully, she had on some music and couldn't hear the symphony of bullets. My heart raced as my mind conjured up the image of a stray bullet piercing the innocence and beauty of my Uma or my young sister Naja. I got home and showed my face and my love so they could sleep. Two and a half hours later, I was out on the ball court for self in the thick of the night. This time, I saw him coming. I kept my eye on him as I dribbled. You front it! It was Tyreek disturbing my peace. I didn't promise you anything, I answered. You could have at least came to check it out, he pushed. It's your thing. Have fun with it. I told him. 
This is your idea of fun, huh? Playing by yourself. Wasting your skills. You talk like you're offering me something more than a game, I told him. Maybe I am. But you gotta step up first. Friday night at 8 p.m. We'll be at the gym again, he said. Friday afternoon, my mind was on finishing up at Cho's. After getting fresh, I planned to walk four stores over on this same block to Akami's job to try and meet her people, introduce myself, and acknowledge my friendship with Akami. I was uncertain about their beliefs and traditions. When I stepped outside Cho's store, Amir and Redbone were standing right there. I was tight about Amir bringing her to another place I considered a permanent spot. At the same time, I figured if he showed up here at my job, which he only done once before, there must be some kind of emergency. I kept myself open to hear him out and help out however I could. What's up, man? I asked him. Hello. How you doing? She answered instead of him. I don't know about tonight, Amir said. We was thinking about going to the movies instead of hooping. Chris, too, I asked, since we were all supposed to meet up at the dojo on Friday nights, as usual, to hustle up a game in the nearby park. Yeah, we're gonna pick Chris and his girl up and head out. What you doing up on this side, I asked him, wondering why he was in Manhattan at three on a Friday afternoon when he attended Brooklyn Tech High School in Brooklyn. I took the day off, been hanging out up here with her, Amir said with a gleam in his eye. I was planning to head over to that high school with you and Chris tonight at 8. I found out there might be some business to make it worth our while in the basketball tournament they having over there, I said to a man, knowing how serious he was about handling business. I purposely left out the name of the high school so Redbone wouldn't end up showing up there too. F*** it then. We can meet up over there for basketball. Afterward, we could hit up the late show on 40 Deuce and meet up with the girls. How'd that sound? He asked, pressing me to agree. But now I was looking over his shoulder at Akemi, who was walking up the block to see me. Redbone, who was constantly staring into my mug, turned around to see what I was looking at. Sounds good, I told the mayor, agreeing and hoping him and his girl would step off before Akemi stepped up and they got even deeper into my business. But the two of them didn't move. So we can invite homegirl, right? She really want to see you anyway, Amir smiled. Akami arrived. She stopped walking and stood about ten feet away from where we were talking. Despite the normal New York crowds, Redbone was picking up on Akami's presence. Her eyeballs kept shifting from Akami to me and back. I didn't acknowledge nothing either way. I wanted her and I'm here to leave. Yeah, no problem. Quickly, I agreed to the homegirl situation to get them out of there. All right, tonight then at the high school, I'll let Chris know, Amir said. They bounced. I watched them disappear around the corner. Redbone turned to look back as they turned the bend. Akami had a new haircut. It was now not as long as it usually was, but still more long than short. It was an Egyptian blunt cut with bangs running straight across her forehead and the rest of her every strand of her hair cut straight and lying on her back. It looked beautiful and set off her eyes in a whole new way. She had on brown tights that covered her legs, a short brown crushed leather jumper dress with a blouse beneath, and gorgeous leather heels with a strap that wrapped around each ankle. The feeling of knowing she was dressing up for me felt good. The idea that anyone passing by could look at her also didn't. As I approached her, her pretty face went sour. She threw up her hand like she was saying, Stop! She turned to leave, took a few steps, turned back facing me, and threw up her hands as if to say, Wait right here. It was bugged out, but I waited. She came back up the block with a little girl around my sister's age or a little younger. I'm thinking, What up with this? The little girl skipped up to me, struck a mean pose, one arm folded into the other like me and her were enemies. 
Akami spoke some Japanese words to the little girl, pushing out each syllable with more passion than usual. The angry little Asian girl, now facing me, translated Akami's fury. You didn't introduce me to your friends, the little girl said. I looked at her, then at Akami. Akami's big pretty eyes curved and then shrank with anger. I paused for a minute and answered. You didn't introduce me to your parents, I told her. The little girl translated. Akami responded to her. My parents are in Japan. Your friends were standing right here between the two of us, the little girl said with even more attitude than Akami. Your aunt and uncle and your store are four doors down. You never once invited me inside, I told her. The little girl translated. That's different. You and I are young. We have our world. They have their world. The little girl, now with one hand on her hip, said on behalf of Akami. So what do you want? Do you want to keep our world separate? Or do you want to come all the way into mine and me into yours? I asked. The little girl's eyes widened a bit. She seemed surprised by what I was saying. Believe it or not, I was surprised too. When she translated my words to Akemi, there was a long pause. So I spoke instead. You can't have it both ways, I told her. On hearing this translated, Akemi's anger softened. She looked at me, her eyes watery again, the kind of tears that don't fall. Softly now she spoke. The little girl interpreted more calmly. How about tomorrow at closing? You can come by my family shop and meet everyone. Then maybe you and I can go out together once more. The little girl asked in a more relaxed tone. Hi, Ashita, I said, which means yes, tomorrow, in Japanese. Akemi bowed, just a slight movement of her head. They both smiled. Akemi grabbed the little girl's hand and they both left. Believe me, I wanted to follow Akemi, her legs moving rhythmically, heels clicking on the pavement. I pushed off to Brooklyn, though. I had to pick up Uma by five and my little sister also. After a hot shower and a family prayer, a delicious meal of Uma's fish seasoned with a Sudanese hot sauce called shata, soup, vegetables, salad, and fresh hot homemade bread felt good in my stomach. Afterward, she served me some strong hot tea, spiced perfectly with ginger and cardamom in a porcelain teacup. It raced around my body, warmed my blood, and gave me a complete and settled feeling. When I left, Uma was just sitting down to her sewing machine. My sister Naja was reading her book out loud like she tended to do. Dressed in my dark blue Nike sweats, wearing a blue Jan sport and a crisp pair of kicks, my hands gripping my basketball, I stepped into the dim hallway of my building and headed out to do one quick Uma Designs hat delivery and then over to the gym. I know, this is annoying. But unfortunately, I got to pause and take a pause because I need you folks to tune in to the next edition of Ralph Reads. For now, I would like or rather love to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook. Send a friend request, while you still can, to Ralph Anthony Garcia on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com, where if you would like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or PayPal pal.me for slash rgmc2407 or cash app my cash tag is rgmc2407 you may also connect with me on my other channel at rgmc2407 and right here on turn the united ronin networks we are ronin fellow royalty pick up a good book read a good story Good self free. I appreciate you and I love you like no food. I will see you folks on the continuation of this Sister Soldier mini series on Ralph Reads. Stay true to yourself 
and everyone else.